thank you firstly for coming all the way to South Africa to participate in this year's Sinai and Darba. There's a lot of excitement for your visit and we're really grateful that you've come so far. It's my pleasure and honor. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Well, we could really speak about anything because you know your, your field of study is, is vast and um, really I know when we were looking at different topics to choose from with, for you to speak at Sinai and Darba, really it ranges for, to, to everything. But I know that there, you have a, a particular specialty and interest in Jewish history. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinated me about Jewish history is that when one uses the word history, it automatically brings connotations of something which is boring and dusty and irrelevant to today. In other words, there's a sense of, well, it's important to know what happened to the world in the past, but what bearing does it have today? And, and that's a question one could ask about general history. And, and I think that there is a lot to be learned from what happened, uh, having a bit of context. And, and I think one of the, the great ills that we live with in the modern world is because attention span is shorter and shorter and shorter. You know, it used to be a news cycle used to be 24 hours and it's now 24 seconds. And it, it's really just speeding up. And, and so that lack of context impacts the way that world events unfold and the way that people understand those world events. But looking specifically from a Jewish point of view, the the role of understanding Jewish history uh, and, um, and another one of the talks that you gave today was uh, on, on the Cairo Kinesa and, and what that teaches us without getting into the specifics of that but you know I, I'd be fascinated to understand your perspective of Jewish history and it's the the importance of its study rather than just seeing it as a, you know a book stuck in a, in a library but do, do you see it as something which is which is important to, to understand um, our Jewish identity and even more importantly our Jewish purpose. So I once heard from a great Jewish scholar that he feels that a digital watch is un-Jewish and an analog watch is Jewish. Why, he says, because you well, see I've the got digital an watch, one as well, you've got, so there you go, <laughs> so you're okay. I'm okay. Right. So you see the digital watch just gives you a window right now. Yes. You don't see where you came from, you don't see where you're going to. Okay, fascinating. So, so Jew Jewish history is about a journey from Egypt and Abraham and so on and so forth all the way through. And it's very relevant in many ways. Just for example, just this last week, the United States Supreme Court ruled that, uh, that, it would, that it was, could not, you could not put Israel and Jerusalem on the same birth certificate. In other words, my children who were born in Jerusalem, four of my children born in Jerusalem, were born in Jerusalem on their United States birth certificate. It says born in Jerusalem, but there's no country. Yes. For purposes of clarity, you live in America. Even I live though, in the United States. Even though yes. you sound like you, you're coming from the MCG. I'm, I'm originally which, from Australia. Yes, I know. Uh, I lived in Israel 15 years. That was mainly we invited you because you'd already That's made right. the move. You know. I lived in Israel 15 years. I lived in Canada for four years. I'm now living in the United States 15 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, which makes me approximately 85 years old if you add it all up. But but anyway, <laughs> so um, my children are not listed as living in Israel, uh, as being born in a country, because they don't recognise Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now. If you know anything about history, which clearly they don't, uh, you, you would point out that uh, the only commonwealth, the only country that, that existed in Israel from the times of pre-biblical times, from the time of the Canaanites, was a Jewish country with its capital as Jerusalem. Yes. I mean, King David ruled from Hebron for eight years, and then following that, Jerusalem and uh, eternal capital of Israel. So, so I think if people would be yeah. more aware of history, that that maybe you know things would work out differently. But also in terms of Jews themselves, I used to have a poster in my room which was put out by the Jewish agency and it had a conical flask from a lab inside the broken remains of, a, of, a, of an ancient urn from the Middle East and it said our future is where our past is. Okay, so let's leave the grammar aside, but, but our future is where our past is is really so much because as Jews we are conveyors of an ancient tradition which has a lot to say about the world today. The more we know about our place in history, where we're coming from, the more we know about our, possible, our, our destiny, our contributions, uh, what our soul is yeah. made of. And, and I think what you're saying is so interesting is how it, it impacts, it's immediately relevant. History is not something about the past that's immediately relevant. This example that you give of Jerusalem is a very important example because, I mean, if Jerusalem is not a Jewish city, which is the capital of a Jewish state of Israel, then, then how can Washington be the capital of the United States or London be the capital of, of the UK, the, uh, Jerusalem predates as a Jewish city of long before of any course. of these cities. There, there is no notion of a city that can be a capital of a country. If Jerusalem cannot be called the capital of Israel, then what city in the world can be called the capital of its own country? 100%. And I would also give another example. Um, for example, we celebrate Purim. Uh, and uh, so you ask most Jews, even Jews who celebrate Purim, what is, what is, what is a poor? 
So if you look in the scroll of Esther, they say Apur is the, is the, the lottery that Haman cast to determine when he'd kill the Jews. I ask people, you ever seen a poor? You know what it looks like? No idea. One of my presentations, I show people a poor in, in, the, in um, Yale University Museum in, the, in Connecticut, United States. They have a poor from the t- period of Persia. It looks like a little die, a dice, uh, with Persian writing on the six sides of it and the type of thing you'd throw to determine a lottery. So here's something which we do and we observe, but we, and we call it Purim, but we've never seen a poor. So yes. if you see a poor, it makes it come alive and it makes it more real. But I think this, this is an important thing about it, it, making it real. The Torah makes very specific claims about historical facts. In other words, it, it's something, uh, and this is why I find very important about what you're saying. Torah is not just a, a philosophy and it's not just um, a, an ideology or a religion. It, it is actually making certain basic claims of fact. The first claim of fact that it makes that God created the world, that's a claim of fact. It's making another claim of fact that the Jewish people were in Egypt and enslaved in Egypt. Another claim of fact that the entire people stood at the foot of Mount Sinai and heard God's voice mm-hmm. and accepted the Torah. Those are specific claims of fact. Our very identity and purpose and mission of the Jewish people today is based on the veracity of those facts. We are Jews today because we were given a divine mission at Mount Sinai. That's one of the reasons why I felt that the Sinai and Daba should carry the name Sinai. Because it's, it's after all a Torah convention. And Torah is rooted in Sinai. And, and that's why these historical facts that you referred to, it, it, um, I would venture to say is more than making those things come alive. It's, it's making it real, as you said. It's, it's, the, it's the sense that, that this, this is real. We, we're not talking about... Um, uh, something uh, which is coming out of mythology. This is real and we are Jews today because these things really happened and they are part of historical record, you know, uh, taking the approach of, of Rav Yudha Levi and the Kuzari and Rav Shimshon of Hirsch and others that talk about the foundation of faith goes far beyond just philosophical um, inquiry but into historical facts. Well, and so Rav Yudha Levi, for example, um, points out that when God introduces himself to the, Jew, to the Jewish people, he doesn't say, I am the Lord your God who created the universe. He doesn't say, I am the Lord your God who created space, time and matter. He says, I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. What he's really saying is, because we can't really imagine creation, we can't imagine Big Bang, we can't imagine these things, no one was there, but we can relate to events of history. Why are we eating matzah every year? Why is it the oldest the oldest religious, continuously observed religious ritual in all of history is probably the fact that we sit down and eat matzah and have a seder every single year as Jews. Where did that matzah come from? Who are we sitting there eating matzah? Jews all over the world sitting eating unleavened bread, eating maro. I mean, that in itself is a historical artifact. The Jewish people almost like a historical artifact in the sense of, of this oldest continued tradition. It's an, it's an amazing thing. And when you also look at the details of life as described in the Torah, you know, you see, just for example, when the Torah speaks about, the, uh, about Joseph, when Joseph is taken out of the pit uh, and brought to Pharaoh, it says he, sh- they, he was taken out of the pit and he shaved and, brought, and they brought him to Pharaoh. I remember one of my kids asking him, like, why do we have to know that he shaved? And so he showered, he shaved, put on deodorant, little, little color, right, and he went to Pharaoh. Why is that significant? The, the, well, one answer at least is that if you look in ancient Egyptian records, you find that in Egyptian court, people who served in the court, people who were in the court, were completely shaven. All the body hair was shaven. Right? And the ancient pharaohs used to wear these ceremonial artificial beards made of lapis lazuli, malachite, carnelian, bronze, etc., etc., with a hook behind their ears because everyone was clean shaven. And, and that it brings a little bit of light into why the Torah mentions that because Joseph comes out of the, the prison, he has to be shaven. And this is, by the way, when the, when the uh, Khartoumim, the pharaoh's magicians, come along and say with the plague of lice, they say, Etzba Elohim, he, oh, it's the finger of God. Why at this point do they admit that it's from God? Answer is they have no hair whatsoever. How are they getting lice? It's got to be a plague. Yes. So, but again, little so details is, like that. This is fascinating what you say because it relates to an issue of what of um, something that I've discussed with my father. My father is a, a retired high court judge and um, he's spent a large part of his legal career understanding evidence. And, and there are certain principles that judges apply to assess if a witness is speaking the veracity of their testimony to, to try and, and one of the most important principles is the issue and he's explained this to me many times and applied it to Torah the issue of context mm-hmm. meaning 
A lie right. has very little context. Mm -hmm. Truth has context. And if you're trying to probe the veracity of the testimony, you need to look not just at what they're saying, but does it intersect with a whole lot of other elements of, of the context of the story. So, for example, if a person says that they were uh, on the way to, to witnessing the murder, they, they caught the number nine bus. Then, then, then the judge will then ask them, what time was it? What else did you pass on the way? Th mm -hmm. That number nine, that route crosses it, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden it starts to build a context for what is, and, and what you're saying is so important about that the comment that Joseph uh, shaved as described in the Torah, it's giving context. And, and all of Jewish history, the matzah, the maror, the, everything Absolutely. that you've been talking about, it's actually sure. about context. It shows the authenticity of the historical experience of the Jewish people. Yeah, I, that's absolutely uh, correct. I, I was just listening to a lecture recently. I teach at Yeshiva University, so I was, I was also, uh, so I, and I was doing a doctorate there. So I was listening to a lecture. One of the professors there was talking about uh, that certain prophets. There are four prophets uh, who all speak heavily focus on social justice, on uh, the prohibitions against oppressing the poor, the widow, and so on, and so on and so forth. People becoming too hedonistic. He says they all lived at the same time, at the time of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. And he said, why is that so? So if you look into archaeology, one of the features that you find about that period of time was that the, the kingdom of Judea controlled a lot of the trade routes of the spices, Africa through the Middle East. They, they used to make a fortune from protection of those trade routes, etc. They used to take a very large percentage of what was taken. And it was a very wealthy kingdom. Yes. But who was wealthy? The merchants, the upper class, the government officials. But the rest of the people, all this wealth didn't help them. They're still eking out a living. They're still not, not doing very well. So all these prophets who lived at it, when archaeology tells us the context in which these prophets were speaking. It tells us it was a time there was wealth on the upper level of society, but the lower level of society was, was not doing well. And so what do our prophets teach us? And what do they talk about continuously at that time? Social justice. Uh, the idea of the, of the, the, the upper class should understand how hard it is for those people. Pr protect the widow. What does God, Lord God want from you? Right? Ki masot mishpat, to do justice, right? To, to, to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. So these, uh, again, you're right. It's the context is very important. It tells us a little bit about why the prophets at this time were talking about this, where at other times they were talking about other, other things. And also, I think, especially for, uh, for, 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 for children, like school age, uh, very often they learn things and it's, it's, it's not put into a historical context. Like they don't know, they have this vision, maybe Rashi, you know, maybe may have met Jeremiah the prophet or, or something like that. You ask him, I mean, you ask kids which came first, the first or second temple. They have to think for a bit, you know, sure. Right? <laughs> so, so, but I think if, if our children in schools would know a little bit more about the flow of Jewish history, who is where and, and, and uh, it would, it would make things come alive a little more and it would make it more relevant to them. And I think it would make it more real. You know, we think of Maimonides, you know, very often we don't know he was a real person. I was just showing in my, my class, you know, a little, we have, a, we have a, a, a manuscript of Maimonides, Guide for Perplexed, in which he does a squiggle because his pen ran out of ink. He dipped it and he does a little squiggle and then he goes on, carries on, right? We have, we have uh, manuscripts of children learning Aleph Beit in Cairo 900 years ago and some of them, were doodling. They looked out of the window. One kid doodles a camel on his Aleph Bait book. Another kid doodles a Nile boat on his Aleph Bait book with Mr. Sun, right, shining on it, etc. Yes. Not much has changed. So that's a great thing. If you know, if a child today sees that, right, he'll he'll realize that yeah, we're, we're the same yes. as they. So what you're saying is, there's another point here. One is the veracity, mm -hmm. and, and as an incredible story to tell if one looks at Jewish history, the, it, it's unparalleled in the annals of, of human civilization a story of a people which is so long and spans so many thousands of years and for which there are literally thousands if not tens of thousands of corroborations and contexts and intersections and mm -hmm. uh, you know just it, it comes to mind the uh, Ir David the excavations there which I've you know visited regularly and it's a favorite of mine when going to to Yerushalayim you know to see you know the palace of King David that the signets that people signed things it, it and uh, you know the the, the the water tunnels and mm -hmm. and the description of the Tanakh and how everything intersects everywhere it's it's, it's just remarkable and that it becomes then such a powerful 
indicator of the authenticity of the entire system that it can be truly inspiring so that's one dimension but the other is that it also it, it makes it real and you can say you can relate it because there were this is being part of a chain of tradition and I think that's the dimension of being a member of the Jewish mm -hmm. people it's it's that Judaism is not just an experience as an individual it is being part of, of a people and to understand that there are people just like us who were going through similar things in their own way and in their own times and 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 the Torah has been with Jews throughout all of these ages and and it's become part of our lives that's such an inspiring story yeah and sure and I think also people who are already studying Torah Talmud Mishnah uh, many many aspects of the Torah uh, if, if, if they'd know a little bit about the history of the commentator who's writing this and what the context was you know, to know that when Maimonides writes in his 13 Principles of Faith, the Torah will not be abrogated. And he uses an Arabic word, nusk, which is the same word that Muslims use to, to describe the idea that they say that God abrogated the Torah in favor of the Quran. So, so Maimonides was, was battling an ideological battle with people at certain times. I know that sometimes my students, I brought in, I have a collection of some ancient coins uh, and uh, they're not, you know, not uh, someone gave them to me and uh, they're not that rare. But it's interesting if you're learning the Talmud and you can see a pruta, which yes. is the smallest type of currency they had, and you can see an iser ha'italki. And these are terms which yeshiva students know, but I'm sure most have never actually seen yes. a, 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 the actual coinage. And they don't know the size of it and they don't know the relationship between one coin and another. And it actually is quite revealing when you're learning the Gemara, the Talmud, and you actually see the coins and understand, oh, that's, that's why that is that. Or, or for example, you mentioned the seals. The Talmud talks about seals of documents. You, you, what's a seal of a document? You know, my signature at the end of an email or my tweet, right? No, what it is basically is that they would have, they'd write a document, they'd, they'd roll the scroll up, they'd tie it with string, and then you'd put a little piece of clay on the knot, which you'd imprint with your particular signet ring and it would have your imprint on it. It was that just called a bulla. And uh, so most of them didn't survive because yes. the clay would get destroyed when you open it up. But we have some in the city of David. Fascinating. Uh, there are some which we, they weren't found in situ, so we're not, but there are some in the uh, Musaif collection in London where you have uh, a couple of seals, clay seals, which say on them, Baruch ben Neria Hasoifer. Baruch, the son of Neria, the scribe. Now, who is that? Jeremiah. The prophet dictated his prophecies to a scribe by the name of Baruch, the son of Neria, yes. who wrote it's his remarkable, prophecies. Remarkable. So, and we've got, uh, I think, two or three of the of the uh, the the bulle of Baruch ben Neria, the scribe, one of with his thumbprint on it, which he accidentally put on. So, if he turns up, we'll be able to identify him. So, uh, <laughs> but I think that you know that the power of this is the establishment of of Torah as a system which is rooted in historical fact and truth mm -hmm. and, and, and what's so important for us as Jews today is those historical facts actually create our moral and spiritual vision for today and tomorrow and, and, and that's why it's so important for, for, for I think for Jews firstly to establish these historical facts as being true and understanding the layers and layers of context and the thousands and tens of thousands of proofs towards this but also to get a sense of what Jewish destiny means. That th there is, there is a, a history which creates a vision, which creates a destiny, and it's a sweep. And, and that's a real sense of privilege to be part of a people that has a sweep of history, but more importantly, that history creates a purpose and a destiny for the future, because that's what Hashem wants from us. But we can only understand the, the privilege and indeed the responsibility of what it means to be a Jew when we see that sweep of history and seeing it with a full perspective. And I think this is what you've been saying. To be a Jew is not just to say, well, I have my own individual personal responsibilities in life. It is, uh, I, I'm part of a mission and it's a national mission. Indeed, it's a global mission. Of, of to make a difference in the world and and there's that understanding of the awesomeness of what Jewish identity and Jewish destiny is all about but you can only get the, the real awesomeness with the sweep of what of what history really shows us is the is the full picture of, of that story I think is also that's true and I think in addition understanding um, and appreciating the miracle uh, of Jewish existence today uh, is only possible if you understand history. If you look at the state of Israel, uh, the revival of a, of a Jewish state in the land of Israel, and as David Ben-Gurion pointed out in his speech to the Knesset on the law of return, 
he said the state of Israel is not something which is created ex nihilo, it's not something which is out of nothing. It's a recreation of a state that existed for over 1,800 years or so, 1,200 years. He says it is a return to where we were. And, and I think a lot of people don't understand just how miraculous it is that a language, for example, has been revived into a daily language used by millions of people, uh, used in an economic uh, and uh, biotech and high-tech powerhouse uh, and these people are sitting there designing Motorola chips and so on and so forth and biotech and they're using Hebrew, the language of our prophets that yes. was written thousands of years ago. It's unprecedented to have a revival like that. To, to, see, uh, to, to see the state of Israel in and of itself not only functioning but thriving and, and to see that in the ancient land when you walk around there and to be able to point to, to, to the ruins of where our ancestors lived, to where our ancestors prayed, where this book was written, where that book was written, what, what Jeremiah referred to and what, and what Yeshua referred to and so Emekale and this and that. And, and, and this area is called the, the Dun Regional Council because that's where Dan was and that's where Shimshon, Samson, right? Hitchil Ruach Hashem Lefa'amor, that God's spirit brought him in on, you know, on the junction where I get the 16 bus or whatever it was. I've got the number of the bus, right? Speaking of your context there. But uh, that is something which is absolutely amazing. Yes. And, and only someone who knows about Jewish history can really appreciate the miraculous nature of that. When Prophet Zechariah, when he comes along and he says that in the future there'll be a miracle, what will be the miracle be? That old men and women and children will walk in the streets of Jerusalem and Judea. So a person who looks at that and says, why is that a miracle? Old men and women walking along in the streets of Judea, that's miraculous? And I think the answer is, yeah, of course it is. Uh, because if you consider what happened to those streets whether it was the Romans, uh, whether it was the uh, whether it was you know the, the Saracens, uh, whether it was the Crusaders, and all the various invaders all throughout history, what happened to those streets? That the fact that there are Jewish children walking on those streets, Jewish old men and women walking on those streets, that uh, that is something which is absolutely yes. miraculous. I just want to tell you a, just a brief story. When I was I was I was uh, in the army and I was on reserve duty. I had an interview for a job in the Israeli army. In the Israeli army, yes. I was in, being interviewed for a job as a rabbi in Canada, and I was able to get off base uh, legally uh, for just a few hours. So, you went uh, AWOL. I, no, I got permission from my officer for the interview. I went to the hotel where the guy was staying. I'm in mean, my uniform with my gun, and uh, I went to the wrong room. Went one flight, flight too high. And uh, guy opens the door of the room. Elderly man. He sees me and he starts crying. No. I, I saw this is not a good way for an interview to start and, <laughs> yes. and uh, it turns out he's not the guy but it turns out he is a Holocaust survivor no. and he said he hadn't been to Israel ever, it's his first trip to Israel the last time he saw a soldier with a yarmulke was when he was liberated from the camps and it was a, an American Jewish chaplain in the United States Army and here he is in Israel and here I am standing at the first morning he's in Israel, got in the previous night and here is a soldier in, in a uniform with Hebrew, with a yarmulke, standing at his door, it was the most emotional moment for him. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, and that's the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that is the miracle. That's the that miracle, miracle of Jewish, Jewish history. history. It's, an unbe- it's an incredible... In, in fact, uh, of um, Yaakov Emden, you know, the famous statement that he made that, um, that the, the miracle of the survival of the Jewish people throughout history, he says is a greater miracle than the miracles described in the Chumash of the splitting of the sea and the ten plagues and the manna falling from heaven the, the, and, and, and what you're saying is, and I think this is a very important point, apart from the fact that history gives us the context and it gives us the, um, the authenticity, shows us the authenticity of the entire system and that it makes it real, it also shows us the miracle of, of, of uh, the, the survival and indeed the thriving of the Jewish people because only if we understand where we've come from can we pr- truly appreciate the miracles of what it means, as you, as, as you so correctly point out, the, the reestablishment of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel the rebirth of Torah learning. Think about that incredible miracle. Well, think about the Sinai and Daba. Here we are (laughs) in Cape Town, South Africa. I traveled here with Chief Rabbi of Israel. I'm meeting with Chief Rabbi of South Africa, and we are here in Cape Town with, uh, I think, about over 1,500 people listening to classes on Torah, listening to Jewish music, uh, praying together, studying together, eating together. That's that's incredible. Because if someone would have said, what are the chances of the survival of the Jewish people and then also the survival of Judaism? Because this, and, and you know, uh, it, it sort of intersects with a lot of the things we've been talking about. But think about the fact that um, the great Rabbi Akiva could, could walk into one of our shuls or Bate Midrash today 
and, and he would fully, we'd be able to have a full conversation with him. He'd appreciate the fact of, of the Pasha Sashavua and, the, and, 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 and the, the, the mission that we'd be learning and the Chumash that we'd be learning and the mitzvahs and the tefillin and the minyanim and the everything. Mm -hmm. there, there's no other people on earth that can say that have that kind of continuity. And, and if someone would have been betting to say, well, you know, who's going to survive? You know, one of my favorite missioners in Pirkavos is from Rabbi Yochanan Asandlar. In chapter 4, Pirkavos, where he says that, um, that what is a Knesia, Shesofele, his kind that will survive forever, endure forever, she Shem Shemaim. And uh, the Avast Rabbi Nassim says, what does it mean, the community that is dedicated to heaven? That's the community of Israel connected to Har Sinai, to Mount Sinai. The Svornos interpretation on that Mishnah is that they were, they were the time of the, of the Roman occupation. And, and, uh, and really the future looked very bleak. And if someone at the moment of the Roman occupation had said, who is going to survive this mighty Roman Empire with all of its prestige and power and military might and economic might, or this beleaguered Jewish people that had been overrun and, and, and was really in, uh, about to go into a very long exile, who, who, where would you put the betting? And, and so really uh, on the conventional wisdom and certainly from a rational point of view, it should have been the Roman Empire that survived and yet they're gone. And even what remains in modern day Italy has no connection at all, neither language, culture or values to anything of the Roman Empire. And yet here we are. That is an incredible, miraculous story. Have a child from Italy read something written in Latin from 2000 years ago. Yes. Not going to happen. I remember my, uh, we were at the Israel Museum. In, uh, in Jerusalem with my kids quite a while ago in the 1900s. Yes. And uh, so one of my kids started reading from one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was a section of Isaiah, Chazon Yeshua Ben Amots. Yes. And he said, Abba, Abba. And I said, yeah. He says, we were doing this in school last week. And I said, it's a miracle. He remembers what he was doing in school. Like, <laughs> but the real miracle was, here he is, a child from the 21st century, yes. right, uh, was, was reading something written under Roman occupation thousands of years ago Right, over about 2,000 years ago, in this, and he can read the language, he understands the context and the subtext. He's got friends called Yeshaya, and he, he's living in Israel speaking that same language. That's yeah, that's exactly what you're saying, and that's yes. tangible. Yes, that's and right. yes, exactly. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful way that really brings together a lot of what we've been talking about today. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you for your time. I think we've touched on some very important ideas about the importance of Jewish history and what it means today. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here, and I really I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.